Great. So, uh, well, I am led to believe that this group has, uh, you know, many of the people here looks like are folks who are doing startups, and then there are folks who are in slightly more mature companies. And uh, my goal here was to kind of give a color into uh, how to, to an example of, or a case study of how to scale a business on a global front in a stuff. And uh, we thought we would, by presenting Zenoni and what our experience has been, hopefully it might help. Uh, so recently, uh, you know, Zenoni, we had raised a large round of funding and, you know, we are uh, fairly, you know, moving forward on the global front in terms of revenue, etc. So what I was going to do in terms of structure was that I'll talk a little bit about Zenoni to give you a color of who we are, then talk about, you know, how we approached uh, trying to go to market and uh, in early days and later how we had to do better in terms of scaling and what we learned. Uh, and uh, towards the end I want to also talk about how to build Zenoti kind of companies and why you can build them out of India kind of stuff. Uh, and of course I'll give you more color into the breakdown that is how uh, we are structured based on India versus uh, uh, the US etc. Uh, we were of course started in Hyderabad uh, and most of our employees are still in Hyderabad. We have about 320 employees here and maybe about 70 uh, odd employees uh, in the US and other places basically. Great, with that, uh, let me get started, hopefully this works. Uh, and by the way, it's, uh, you know, I, it, it's, uh, I, I, I hope this is aligned with everybody's interest, but I'm, I'll try my best to keep it short so that if you have questions, then that will, the questions obviously would be aligned with your interest. So, uh, I can answer anything you have. So what do we do? We are basically an end-to-end -end, uh, software solution for the wellness industry. Think of it like spa, salons, fitness, group classes, and all that. You'll wonder, that seems like a very small space, but I'll talk about it, and I do think it still turns out to be an interesting business proposition. Yes, uh, in, if you break it down further in terms of what we do for this industry, we do three things. We help them manage their operations, which is run their day-to-day -day store, appointments, collect money, uh, pay their employees, uh, you know, buy products, sell products in the store, that kind of stuff. We also help them elevate guest experience, which means how do you engage with the guest, how do you, how do guests pay and walk out of the store, etc. And then driving revenue is how do we help them make more money. And the way we achieve that is through multiple modules uh, in all those areas. So fundamentally that means we are a fairly broad like we are an ERP, CRM, everything that this business may need, who's a customer of ours, to run their entire business. You know? So we are the backbone for many. As an example, in, in India, I would say Lakme Salons or Kaya Skin Clinic, their entire business runs on Zenoti. You know, whether it is a front desk, whether it's the back office, they are using Zenoti kind of stuff uh, to run their whole business. Now, in terms of the industry itself, uh, just going back, yeah, so the world is moving more towards an experience industry. Earlier it was more about retail products, but the whole service industry is growing pretty fast in our opinion. And I'll spare you the details of how we arrive at this addressable market. It's about $14 billion in terms of the software opportunity to sell uh, to this market globally. So that's a fairly big market. It's not big enough. It's not like a $200 billion or $300 billion market. But 14 billion is still respectable, though it's supposed to be a smaller market that you're going after on a global basis kind of stuff. So then, you know, what are we trying to do to this industry? I tell you, at a big picture level, these are the three things we do and we run the backbone. But I want to give you a little color. It's not enough to say I'm just the backbone. We are trying to change the rules as, as a way to get into uh, these companies, uh, into the target customers. So the world today is like everybody wants everything immediately, it's on the go, whether it's your cab ride or your coffee uh, and you know all those elements. Whereas if you look in our space, that's not necessarily true yet kind of stuff, right? So a good example of a company which is a brick and mortar company which has really transformed the retail experience is Starbucks. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen it, but in the US at least, uh, Starbucks is uh, 30 to 40 percent of their uh, money is collected through mobile apps. That means people don't go to the front desk to pay for it to the counter at all. They just pay on the fly and they go get their drink and leave kind of stuff. 
so they are really innovative. It's it's hard. When, it's disrupting is easy when you're saying Uber comes from the side, but Starbucks has learned to say, I have a normal business, but I'm transforming. And today, Starbucks collects the most amount of money through mobile apps globally. You know, they're the number one leader. It is. It's not Apple. It's not anyone else kind of stuff, which is surprising to them. So basically, what Starbucks? How did they achieve that? Is through an IT infrastructure with an enterprise focus, right? So they built a whole backbone so that you can go into any Starbucks store, you get loyalty points, you can use them anywhere, you can uh, pay with the same card on file, no matter which Starbucks in the U.S. you walk into, kind of stuff. So that's a great brand experience. So that's our goal as an OT. Say for the wellness industry, can we be that single backbone, one solution? Uh, which redefines how the wellness industry should operate fundamentally kind of stuff. So to give you color into what do I mean by that, right? So you get a sense of what, we, what am I talking about. So if I take an, a typical example of like Mario Tricochi is a, one of the leading brands in the US, which has only 14 locations, not like Lacme, which has 500 locations, but you know, they're smaller. But I can tell you Mario Tricochi is bigger than Lacme in terms of revenue. They do $80 million a year out of just 14 locations. So this is like a very high-end business. And the way the flow of uh, traffic or their business works is you have a reception where someone walks in, it takes uh, 10 minutes or so you to wait, your stylist will come pick you up. The provider, the stylist is going to work with the customer while working. Uh, they may try to coordinate something like saying, hey, I want to do a manicure also. Can I go ahead and do it? They have to go tell the front desk because the front desk shouldn't book their time, etc. And then they have a whole back office which is busy doing all the, uh, you know, uh, corporate stuff, which is paying employees on, uh, on a monthly basis, following up with uh, customers who are not returned. They have a call center which is taking calls for appointment booking, uh, you know, and that's how their business runs. It's a very complex business actually compared to a traditional retail business because it's service. When there is services involved, actually it starts becoming extremely complex. So what do we mean by transforming this kind of a business, right? So you take a reception desk which looks like that. There are three, four computers at the front desk, checkout counters, all that stuff. And you say, hey, that changes, which means there's a front, there's no front desk. You walk in, you can check in at a kiosk, or if you have an app, it pops up and says, hey, you're already checked in, take a seat, and your stylist will be with you. And the stylist gets notified saying, hey, your guest is here for the 2.30 appointment, can you go get that kind of stuff? So there's nobody involved in all this. It's just the person walking in and uh, like pretty much like the way you think of it, Uber-like experiences. And then if the stylist does any upgrade, they add a service, they can do it in their phone, uh, saying I've just added a new service for this customer. Or if they want to take notes, when we say digital forms, if you've gone for a facial or a skin care, you know, they can mark up what they have done, they can take a picture of the customer, uh, they can have two-way communication with the customer. Like you talk to your Uber driver, you can talk to your stylist and all that stuff, you know, exchange, saying, hey, I'm running late, or the stylist can say, try to upsell you something and all that stuff. And finally, of course, the checkout. The checkout process is multiple models. You can check out using tablets or you can check out on a phone, which means when you're about to, when you're done, like your Uber driver marks saying I'm done, the stylist says I'm done and our app charges the customer. You know? So that's kind of a new flow of how a business uh, we are trying to transform uh, the business, right? So now let's look at how did the business evolve, right? I just want to give you a color into what was in OD so that you're all aware of what kind of work we do so that it puts it in perspective. So our revenue growth over the years is just, I've not put the numbers actually, uh, but needless to say today we, we continue to grow over 100% year over year kind of uh, thing. But the interesting part is the composition of our revenue. We did start off being an India-centric uh, revenue. So in the beginning of the in 2013 is when we started looking at the US as a market and a real meaningful uh, kickoff of the company. Uh, you know, most of our revenue was uh, in the US. And then over time, it has, you can see, oh, sorry, in India, and over time, it has, India has been a smaller and smaller percentage. And today, 60% uh, of our business is the US. Second is Australia, New Zealand, uh, and India comes a little later in terms of the size of the market. But when we did start off, we went from India to the Middle East and Southeast Asia as the immediate adjacent markets and trying to sell to those markets. And I do think the Middle East and Southeast Asia were fairly similar in the nature of market to India, so the product work. But we went to the US, the product doesn't necessarily work as is. It does require uh, a lot more uh, improvements uh, to meet the needs of uh, different business models that the US runs with. 
So in the early days, our go-to market was, you know, we would sell to anybody, which means, you know, you are any salon, any spa, anybody I would sell to kind of stuff, right? We would go to trade shows because we didn't know anybody. It's not like we knew people in the industry, right? So we had to, uh, we didn't have board members who were uh, industry veterans, nothing. Uh, we had to go about it ourselves. And then, of course, we went, when, especially when we went to the US, you know, I literally, I personally or some of the other management team members, we would go and check out a business. Check out a business means we really have to go take services, talk to the receptionists, talk to the staff, understand what their pain points are, what's going on in the business. Because then we would come back and send an email to the CEO or whoever saying, because now that we understand the details of their business, we can speak to them in a more intelligent way. So that kind of approach, and then we had, product marketing videos or things which were very product centric, trying to say how our product is much better than uh, how they are doing things, etc. But it's not as business centric, it's more, uh, you know, product oriented messaging. So that's how we started. Yes, we did win some accounts, we usual startup kind of pains of finding a few accounts here and there. But as you move forward, you know, what we realized is this is a very complex business and this is my main, you know, takeaway, if anything I would ask you to take away from this talk is this, which is uh, the point we have to, uh, to make here. We saw that there are a lot of businesses. When you look at it from outside, you'll say, what's the big deal? There are salons, then there are some spas, and then there may be some med spas. Med spas means kaya kind of people who do laser. Uh, care or, you know, kind of treatment kind of uh, businesses. And then, okay, there's fitness too, kind of stuff, right? That's about it, is how you would do it. But actually, when you peel it back, there is a lot more. Within salons, you have barber shops where you put your name and weight, kind of stuff. You have luxury salons. If you walk in without an appointment, they'll make you feel like, what are you doing here? You know, because you just don't walk into those businesses without getting an appointment ahead of time. And, and so you can keep going through there are a lot of different kinds of business models. There are places which are just nail salons or waxing businesses, etc. Similarly, in, in med spas as well, there are a lot of different kinds of med spas. It's not just one kind. And it does matter all these different categories, you know, because the requirements are very different, the buying decisions are different. When you go talk to a resort spa, it's not easy to sell to a resort spa. The hotel is not going to make that decision that fast, you know. So you have to think about what it means when you sell to a membership-based spa. It, membership means it's you pay $50 a month and maybe you get a massage or something. Now the challenges of that business and trying to win that business onto your platform are a whole different ballgame kind of stuff, right? So basically, we quickly realized that the, you know, started to understand the market a little bit and say, hey, we are going all over the place. We are getting one guy who's a barber shop, one guy who's a hotel guy and uh, you know it's not helping us because everybody has different requirements of course being in India you know you get more dev development power behind you compared to being in the US so you can afford to be wrong for a little longer kind of stuff right so then what did we do we went back to the drawing board as we learned more and today I can tell you we structure the market this way we say hey there are salons and within salons there are walk-in salons queue based luxury salons kind of stuff, and then there is spas, which are, you know, different kinds of spas. Then we say the med spa stuff, we break it down further into med spa, weight loss, fitness kind of uh, buckets. And then we say, who owns it? Are these company owned or are these franchise businesses? Like Lakme is a franchise business with some corporate control kind of stuff, you know? Kaya is not a corporate, is not a franchise business, it's a corporate business. They own the outlets kind of stuff. And then the regions, which, which regions do you want to sell in? And then you say, what software? This is, what are they using right now? So if I'm trying to sell to someone, they're all using different kinds of desktop products, which are really old products inside those stores, uh, kind of stuff. And then what is the size of these businesses? Are they large enterprises, SMEs, etc.? Now, with all the variables on the table, we get to take stake of saying, which one should we go after? You know, so today I can tell you, okay, we've gone a while, we have at least the red ones are those on the left side which we don't want to go after, which means we're not ready for them. So we're crystal clear as an organization. Any of these guys call, just tell them they're not for you. Don't even fudge it, don't even try. I can tell you as a startup, if I was earlier on, if I gave my software to any small startup guy, you would be very anxious to sell if Taj calls and says, I want to buy your software. Because it's like, hey, my software works. I do everything for Spas. Why don't you want to let me sell it to this guy? Because it doesn't allow us to scale anymore. Because that guy will come back with some issues, some problems, and we'll have to address those issues and features in our product and stuff. 
Similarly, on the right side also, we have taken a stab at saying, what is it we are very good at in terms of green? What is it we have an aspiration to move towards in terms of blue? But the reds are like still don't touch that kind of stuff, you know? And the gray ones are like, when we say, you know, regions we put India, Middle East as grays. We don't have an active sales process in those regions, but we just, if somebody calls, we do follow up, we take care of it because we have a very strong presence in the market kind of stuff, right? So that's how we define it. So I think, it's very important for everyone to really choose what do you want to sell to. If you can't choose that, like this morning also, this evening when I was the product, uh, when I was the watch, look up to some of the product folks, they're building products which can go to a lot of segments, a lot of places. And with my exposure, at least of it, I get scared. Like, shit, man, this is so many people you could be selling to. Like, I wish you could pick one, you know, just pick one and sell for six months to that just that one guy. And if you can do great with that one guy, then you, can, you have every authority to go into every segment you want to. You, it's, it's open uh, field because once you get your revenue up, like, you know, 2 million, 3 million, 5 million, whatever, you have oxygen so that you can actually take off the company kind of stuff. So I think we learned this uh, on our own over time kind of stuff as we went. Then, today, where do we invest? Because we are enterprise uh, SaaS, as I said, we are like an end-to-end solution. We only invest in those things on the left side, which is, we call it account-based marketing, outbound email, uh, sales, sales enablement tools kind of stuff, uh, and some of our messaging, positioning work, and product marketing work. We have now started to do direct mail. So which means, we don't do any of the stuff on the right side. We don't do any SEO work. We are not interested in, in increasing our ranking online. We are not, we don't do any ad words, we don't spend a penny on that. Uh, we, nothing, no print ads, no trade shows. Uh, you know, today we don't do. Early days we did, you know, when we were first starting off. Because we wanted to learn. Trade shows was not about winning business, it was about meeting people and learning a lot about the industry. That's how I see it, you know, stuff, right? So that's how we, it is. Because uh, a lot of the SEO and ad word stuff, for example, what ends up happening is, you know, you can spend the money, but I'm choosing to say I'll only focus on some segments, I'll only focus on businesses which have more than four outlets and all that. All that will happen is 80% of the money you spend on Google AdWords is waste because they're all people who are coming who have one center, two centers, and you know, I'm spending all this money and getting all these leads which I don't want. So uh, even in SEO, by the way, even today, uh, about 70% of the leads that come on our website, we reject them. We actually tell them, we give them the names of all our competitors and say, please go here, talk to these people, right? Because, uh, and we have a very strict process where our services teams would get very upset with the sales guy if he doesn't comply with the matrix that we have agreed to. So the sales guy, you know, of course he wants to sell and he has a quota and he can make it happen, but, you know, he knows it won't work if he tries to close a sale which doesn't meet the criteria kind of stuff. Okay, so that's why we don't invest in some of those things. So talking about what we invest in, to give you a little bit more color into how do we scale that, right? So if you take the outbound campaigns that we do, firstly, I said we did a lot of research early days by visiting the store, taking services, talking to employees, doing all that. Today we have the ability of the team in India, which sits and analyzes a business based on publicly available data online, trying to say how big is this business, what is the size of this, uh, what is the uh, uh, price of their services, uh, their Yelp reviews online, where are they spending, how is their ad board ranking. Based on all that, our team figures out categorizing that store into one of those buckets. They know what software they're using, what kind of a business model it is, and all that. So once we have figured that out, then they have a whole outbound uh, strategy, which is like, there are multiple cadences, but you know, for everyone, if you're a salon coming from this software with this kind of a criteria, then we have a whole matrix of saying, this is the kind of content and outbound email campaigns that we believe will work well. So then there's a cadence set up which goes out, you know, every five days or whatever, which, and that's how we open most of the doors we open today. Uh, it happens in that fashion. That is, we do research. Uh, it's all done out of India. We don't do anything in the US in terms of region. And they, uh, you know, we just got good at the content part of it so that, uh, you know, we are able to completely do this. So it's very low cost. Investors, when they look at us, they get surprised about our customer acquisition cost. They say, hey, it just is peanuts compared to what they are used to in SaaS. Our customer acquisition cost is like two months of CAC, like two months of revenue that they pay. That's all we spend on sales and marketing kind of stuff, right? So it's because we are very selective on where we spend the money. We don't go uh, much into other areas. 
Then, so doing this in multiple niches, so for all those things like your full service salons, your men's spas, different things, you have to figure out not only the product, but your go-to-market scaling strategy for every niche separately. If I just apply the same mails and same methodology, same content for every niche, it won't work very well, you know, so it has to be customized and tailored. And that's one of the reasons why companies like Zenoti, in my opinion, and investors resonate this with very well with this, is you can't build these companies out of the US. If I tried to build Zenoti out of the US, to, you know, it would have shut down long ago because I'm dealing with so many niche verticals within the vertical that I'm in. And in order to win this space, I need to be able to invest both in the product and in my go-to-market strategy, which is highly tailored. So it's very hard to scale that. So the cost of it can be very prohibitive trying to do it in the US kind of stuff, right? So I think being based out of India has always been a blessing in that way. So in terms of how we are structured as an org, just so you have color, on our sales front, as I said, all our sales lead gen, uh, sales ops is based out of Hyderabad. But our field sales, when we say field sales, the main sales reps are based out of Seattle. So we don't go travel to the customer, even the Seattle guys. They do it online kind of stuff, but that's how it is. So our cost for lead gen remain very low. Uh, and then the product front, we have product management leadership in the US, but we have a lot of product managers here as well. And the entire engineering, of course, is here, 100%. There's no, uh, no engineering talent at the other side. And in services front also, like some of the product man uh, sorry, project manager kind of people who are helping our customers on board to Zenoti are in the US and Seattle. The entire services team behind them is also based out of Hyderabad. And from a support perspective, we have a few folks uh, in the US, but the majority of our technical support is over here. Again, I do believe this kind of a structure enables us to scale. So we could keep our costs very low early days uh, by doing most of the work out of India. Uh, today, now that we have capital, of course, we can invest more uh, in the different markets. So we can, we are in the UK and we are in multiple markets kind of stuff in terms of way to it. So I do believe the reason we have an opportunity to build these kinds of companies, I think it comes down to twofold here in, in India. One is you all must have heard a lot about this, this notion of democratization of software, which is, you know, hey, the cloud makes it feasible that whatever software we were build with large IT companies could you know, build and deliver to large companies is now available for every mid-level mid company as well. And the mobile on top of it is making it very easy to deploy, you know, interesting solutions uh, which are available to mid-sized companies or small companies as well kind of stuff. So the moment that is happening, then you can do that from India too because you don't need to do all this on-site deployment, go set it up on servers and all that. So that bridge we crossed a while ago, but that is the bridge which is enabling us to create global uh, SaaS companies from India. And the second one which I do think is the important one is the verticalization which is happening kind of stuff, right? So Zenoti kind of stuff, what I said is we are a vertical software, we are the infrastructure for this industry kind of thing. So the more verticalization is getting accepted, that is a company, nobody in our industry when I go out and meet people, they're not buying Microsoft Dynamics or SAP or Salesforce to run their business. They are only buying verticalized software for them running their business, you know, they can't uh, you know, you will see several segments which will end up in that fashion where the horizontal players, traditionally Oracle, SAP, Microsoft will be like, hey, what happened to these markets? They're not even available to us. So they're going to have to wake up at some day and say, hey, most of the industries are ending up with these vertical solutions. So what am I doing here trying to build all these uh, horizontal apps kind of stuff? So I do think that trend will unfold even more strongly going forward. Uh, there are some companies which are clearly emerging as and showing that they will place have a dominant space vertically. And the advantage of that verticalization is the markets become small. They are not large markets. When Salesforce is going after market, it's maybe I don't know what the size is. It may be a trillion dollar market that they're going after. It's huge. So whereas in, when you do go after vertical markets like restaurants or spas, salons, they may turn out to be only 10 million, 50, you know, 8 million, whatever that kind of size. For 10 billion, 8 billion dollar kind of markets, it is better and easier to develop that software from India and have a go to market and have the scale and the acceleration. Versus doing it out in the US, I think, can always be this hard. There will always be an edge for that. And that's one of the reasons you'll see why, uh, you know, if you've read recently the, you know, people like Tiger Global, and there's a few others who are, who are there as well, who are really betting. They're not just randomly investing on in companies, they're betting that. 
hey, some of these kinds of SaaS companies which come out of India are fairly guaranteed to be successful because fundamentally the US guys won't be able to compete if they are 100% US based. So I think whenever they find an opportunity where somebody from our ecosystem emerges as being able to sell on the global platform, I think you'll find that access to capital will be too easy because they're just waiting to look for such companies to emerge. So that's all I have.